Hello, I'm David Resnick and I come to you from my research laboratory in the vivarium at the University of California in Riverside. And this laboratory is devoted to the study of evolution in fish, which is the project that I'll be telling you about today. I am the principal investigator of a grant funded by the National Science Foundation as part of their Frontiers in Integrative Biological Research program. This program funds multidisciplinary, multi-investigator grants and the goal of the program is to bring together researchers from diverse disciplines and have them address a common project with the goal being to create a whole that is much greater than the sum of all of the parts. The idea is that we'll, we will contribute to each other's research and enable all of us to do work that goes beyond what we normally would be able to do on our own. The title of our project is From Genes to Ecosystems, How Ecological and Evolutionary Processes Interact in Nature. And what you're seeing in this photograph is most of the senior investigators that are involved with the project, but we actually have about two to three times as many people associated with the research now because it has a large training component, including undergraduates and graduate students and postdocs. And what I'll be doing today is introducing a series of videos that were made on site in Trinidad. And so we'll take advantage of the aesthetic beauty of the mountains and the mountain rainforest and streams where we do our research. But before I do that, I'll be presenting a four-part introduction that gives you a conceptual background to our research. Now, as part of the video menu itself, you'll get to meet some of the people who are involved in the work, including the undergraduates and the graduate students. You'll also get to see a river tour, which is a tour of the drainage where we do all of our work starting at the, where it's a big river downstream, heading up into the small tributaries. Along the way, I'll tell you about what the communities are like, and I'll introduce you to the fish, and I'll also introduce you to some of the basics of our research. Other menus in our video series will include details about how we actually do our work, and so you'll get to see more details about the research program, but you'll also be able to get to see scientists at work and to see how we do our research. Now, our program actually represents an integration of a number of very different disciplines. One of them is ecosystems ecology. Another is a specialized body of ecological theory called adaptive dynamics theory. We also have a consortium of population and evolutionary biologists in our program. And finally, we have evolutionary geneticists. And all of us are putting our heads together to work on solving a common problem. Part one of my introduction is to introduce you to the way we usually think about the relationship between ecology and evolution. And that usual approach to the relationship between the two is that ecology shapes how evolution happens. The idea is that the environment that the animal lives in, being the physical environment, but also the biotic environment, the organisms that it lives with, create a template. And that template shapes the evolution of the organism under consideration. Now to illustrate this, I'm going to turn to what I think of as the best known example of evolution in action in a natural system. And that's the body of work that was done by Peter and Rosemary Grant and their colleagues on the evolution of the medium ground finch. What you're looking at in this slide are Peter and Rosemary Grant. But in the lower left-hand corner of the figure is the island of Daphne Major. And that was their study site. Daphne Major is actually a volcano that erupted underneath the surface of the ocean grew to the surface and then emerged as a volcanic cone, as dry, lifeless land that was colonized by plants and animals from elsewhere. They were studying the medium ground finch, and what you see pictured here are two individuals in the population that they studied. Now, ground finches are like all other organisms, which is that they vary. Not all individuals are like so many peas in a pod. They differ from one another in whatever attribute you would care to look at. The obvious differences in these two animals is that the bird on the left is one that has a very stout, heavy bill, and the one on the right has a narrower, finer bill. What the Grants established early in their research program was that these differences in bill dimension are functional. The animal on the left can generate more force with its bill, more crushing force, which means that it can take a larger seed and crack it and get the food that's on the inside. The animal on the right has a weaker bill. It's less able to crack seeds, but the bill is more like a fine forceps. It's better able to handle and process small seeds. And so these individual variations that you're looking at have an important functional difference. And all populations of all organisms have such individual variations. That represents the fuel or the basis of evolutionary change. Now, one of the interesting things about the island of Daphne Major 
which wasn't really part of the goals of their study at the outset, was that the climate on the inside of the volcanic crater, which is where the finches live, changes remarkably from one year to the next. On the right-hand part of this slide, what you're looking at is the appearance of the interior of the crater during a remarkable drought that happened in 1977 and 1978. And what you can see is that there's very little in the way of living plants present at that point in time. On the left-hand part of the slide, you see the same crater five years later, which was during an El Nino event. And one of the things that happens on this island during the El Ninos is that there's heavy rainfall. And so during 1982 and 1983, we instead see that the interior of the crater was covered with grasses and shrubs. Now there's a difference between these two time periods in the kind of food that was available to the finches. During the drought, there were no seeds being produced by the plants, and the seeds are what the finches live on. And so what they had to do was to mine seeds from the seed bank that was present in the soil, and they mined out all the smaller, more desirable seeds that were available there until they were left with just the large, heavy-shelled seeds. When this happened, finches began to starve and die. And the ones that were able to survive were the ones that had the heavier bills. The bigger-billed birds were better able to make use of the thick-shelled seeds that were left in the seed bank. So they were much more likely to survive. They were the ones that successfully bred the following year when the rains began again. They were the only ones alive to breed. And their children looked like they did. These individual differences are ones that are heritable. Parents and offspring look alike. And so the average attributes of the population in the year after the drought were more similar to the bird on the left-hand side of the slide than on the right-hand side of the slide. During the, the wet year, what we found instead is that there is an abundance of small seeds, and as a consequence, the birds that were more like the ones on the right-hand side of the slide were better able to feed themselves. They had smaller, narrower bills, which are more agile in handling the smaller seeds, so they were more likely to survive and to su successfully reproduce. And so in the year after the heavy rains, they were the ones whose offspring dominated the population, and the population on average was more like the bird on the right than the bird on the left. This is evolution by natural selection. Evolution by natural selection capitalizes on individual differences. Some animals or plants have attributes that make them better able to survive and reproduce in a given set of environmental circumstances, and as a consequence, more of their offspring comprise the following generation, and the average properties of the population change over time. This example also tells us something about what the process of evolution is like, or at least traditionally how we perceive it, and that is that the environment, the physical environment and the biological environment, presents a template to the animal. In this case, the template was drought versus rainfall and the range of seed size availability to the finches, and the finches evolved to adapt to the current template, but how they evolve varied from year to year. The environment is not always the same, and so what natural selection favors and how populations will evolve is not the same either. But the main message here is that our traditional view of the relationship between ecology and evolution is that ecology presents a template and evolution causes animals to evolve in a way that makes them better able to fill that template.